Thank you. Uh, thanks for watching. You are tuning in tonight to Truth and Justice with Vivian King, and I'm your host. We have a great show planned for you tonight where we're going to educate you about the criminal justice system. Take your call-in questions. Don't forget to call in. The number will be flashing soon. I have two great guests in the studio tonight. One is Martha Marie Preston, commonly known as Marie Preston. Uh, she's the author of a new book, and she's going to tell us her story. It's a great story about uh, the criminal justice system. I also have with me Miss nicknamed D. Jenkins, Miss Doris Jenkins. She's going to, Doris Jenkins, uh, she's going to talk to you a little bit more and answer any questions that you have. Well, we're going to just jump straight into it. Um, we have Miss Marie Preston. She's going to, she's uh, been to federal prison uh, with the drug program, and she went to prison had a 40-year sentence, came out, and is doing wonderfully. She made a way out of no way, and she's going to answer your questions tonight. So uh, thank you for joining me, uh, Marie, and thank you for volunteering to tell your story. I have a hard time getting people to, to tell their stories, and stories need to be told. We need to learn about the, the criminal justice system through the eyes of real people. And I'm so proud of you, and I, and I love your story. So let's just jump r right into it. I, I kind of want to start from the beginning so people will know a little bit about your background. So tell us where you're from, and just start talking about your background and some of the things that shaped the decisions in your life. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, I, am, you, I am excited, really, about being here. Uh, I tell people I'm overcome by the words of my own testimony. Uh, telling my story, it helps me every time I tell it. It helps me. It kind of helps set me free. Um, I grew up in a little town called Royal Terrace. Uh, it was about, I guess, a population of a couple of hundred people. Had one way in at the time and one way out. And growing up in this little country town, it was somewhat what you call like a community of uh, people. Everybody knew everybody. And my, my father and my mother had 12 of us. So I was the seventh of 12 kids. And growing up in that little town, uh, people today wouldn't think that back in the uh, early 60s uh, that people lived like that. But we lived in a little, little country town where there was no running water. We had outside pump and outside toilet and, and uh, lamps. We lived like that. And uh, it was somewhat hard for us. I can remember as a kid, uh, my mother used to cook at this wooden stove all the time. And uh, so we would... Uh, we would be glad when she cooked us. We called them whole cakes back then. This day they call them pancakes, but we called them whole cakes then. And she would cook for all of us and sit us around this big wooden table. And we really enjoyed our family together. Having a big family was one of uh, the good things for me with the sisters and brothers. And I can remember when my mother first left home. And how old were you when I your mother was left about, home? About eight years old. I would say around eight. I come home one day from school and my mother wasn't there. And my father was sitting there and he was had his head down and he was somewhat kind of crying to himself and he said that we asked where our mother was and he said she was going to live with her mother. We asked him where are we going to and he said no, y'all gonna stay here with me and I'm gonna raise y'all. And we was like wow, but to me that was really, really a hurting thing mm -hmm. and a turning point for me in my life because I was used to my mother being there and I needed my mother. And um, at that time, she, she, she was gone when I really needed her the most. So growing up in school, going to school with, I guess with uh, your hair not combed most of the time and somewhat uh, dirty clothes, uh, clothes that you done wore two or three days. And um, it was kind of hard for me. Bad mm -hmm. feet, sometimes I was bad foot, didn't, didn't have shoes. and. Um, and hungry. My father worked for a company called Ola Madison Chemicals, so uh, he would get paid every other week. So one week we'd have food, and the next week we didn't. And and it was it was it was terrible for me. It was terrible. When I look back on it, it was it was horrible. Even though he loved us and he took us to church every we say Wednesday night, every Sunday, uh, we was in the choir and that kind of stuff. He was a deacon in church. It was really a bad way to live, and we're not knowing. I guess everyone out there lived a little bit below poverty, but we thought because they had clothes and shoes that they was rich. Right. We had put that in our mind that everybody's rich but us. 
we the only poor people out here. Let me ask you this. When your mother left when you were eight, how did y'all survive? Like, uh, who bought your clothes? Did you wear your sister's clothes? I mean, how, how did that happen? Well, we kind of, by me being in the middle of a seventh child, they kind of hand down what your sister wear, and, uh, and they would hand it down to us every now and then, probably maybe once a year we got some Goodwill clothes. Our father would take us to the Goodwill and he would buy us a skirt and a blouse or a dress and, and, and that was it. He thought that should last, you know. Mm -hmm. So we just had to somewhat kind of take care of those pieces. Uh, the only time we got in the mode is when we kind of either towed that up or we grew out of it, you know. But tell us about the hustle game. So mm -hmm. at eight, your mother left you. Y'all had to fend for yourself with your father working all the time. Yes. Uh, tell me when you start uh, hustling, as we um, nickname and say. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it was probably around eight or nine after she left. Me and my brother, a brother of mine, we used to go to a place called a Hobo Jungle. It was a railroad track that kind of ran through the city. And on the other side of the track, it had these jungles, you know, like uh, trees and the woods. And hobos would come through on the train. And they would get off and maybe spend a couple of days in that jungle before they moved on. And we would go over and find these hobos. And back then, I never saw a black hobo. They was all white hobos. White hobos. And I would go there, and they'd be sitting around this, this fire. They'd be the maid. And we would go up to them, me and my brother, and we'd cut a deal. We'd tell them, listen. Here's what we got. We can take you to the community to get some food. But the deal is, when you get it, you got to split it with us. Mm -hmm. And they'd be like, okay, we can do that. And say, now we're going to tell you the people houses that have money. We think that's rich. Mm -hmm. You go there, and they're going to give you the food, but we're going to split it. And they said, okay. So we would take them to the, what we call back to our community, and we would burn at a person's house and stand on the corner and watch them go. And they would open the bag. And the people would go, go come to the door, and then they knock, they open the door, and they go back. They shut the door, and that, when they shut the door, we say, oh, no, they're not going to give them anything. But they'd come back in a few minutes, open the door, and fill that bag up, just give them a bag of stuff. And we knew then we did hit gold. We didn't hit the jackpot. We'd get back to the hobo jungle. We'd make them uh, spread it out, and we would count it. That's really how I learned really how to count. If they gave them a, uh, 10 cookies, I, we count one for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. You know, that's two cooks. We get it. So we would split the bread, we split the meat, and we split the cookies. And so that's how we survived. We'd take that, and we would eat ourselves, and then we would run home and split it with the rest of our sisters and brothers. So we started hustling back then. That's how I hold that, hold that thought, Marie. Let me mm -hmm. take a caller. Caller, you're on. Hey, Vivian, this is Jolanda. Hey, Jolanda, how are you? Hey. Hey, do you have a do you have a comment? Yeah, I was I was listening um to the young lady and I think a lot of people don't have uh an understanding of how some people grow up. I I listened to her story. I listened to how it was sort of similar to how I grew up and a lot of people in my family grew up where the only meals we get had a day were at school or we got free lunch at the CUNY home and it's hard to focus in school, and so what a lot of people don't understand, they think kids are bad or people are bad, and they end up getting caught up in the criminal justice system like a lot of people in my family. Uh -huh. But I think people need to hear the stories because, I mean, you have a kid who's eight, and she's trying to hustle. I and mean, if you think about it, her dad was working. He was honorable. He was a deacon at the church. He took him to church, but you had eight-year-olds trying to feed themselves. Right, and Sometimes 12, you and 12 kids that, total. You know, you hanging out with hobos, they're probably not the best role models. But it wasn't done in a negative way, and so people do what they need to do to survive. And I think that, you know, what I'm listening to is a lot of story. There's a lot, of like, it's a, it's a story of very many people. They end up getting caught up. The next thing you know, they're in the criminal justice system when, I mean, society just sort of failed them. I agree with you. Thank you for calling in. Uh, Marie's story gets really good, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more. And please call us back. Okay. Well, I, I'm glad you have the show. I'm watching. You know, I'm, I'm, I think it's a great show, and I'm out to look it. All right. Cause we're we're gonna talk more about the uh, drug game in the federal system. So uh, just call us back with any questions or comments. Okay. Thank you. That was my good friend, Jolanda Jones. All right. All right. I thank her for her comment too. Right. Yeah. 
But um, we, uh, we got, I, I would say that that was survival for us. That's when we moved in survival, survival mode. Now, I heard us tell you that they could get free lunches, but it was 12 of us, and the system would not give my father free lunches for us. They said that he worked for Older Madison Chemical, that he made enough money to pay for our lunches. And so we couldn't get free lunches. So it was hard on him because he didn't get paid till every other week. So right. one week we got seven cents for a bowl of soup, and the next week we was hungry. And them hungry cramps would kick in at school. <laughs> no, that's right. And I would be mad. And not, Back then we had what you call blackboards growing up, a little girl. And, and they put the lunches behind the blackboard. And I used to go back behind the blackboard when I get just too hungry, and they take a break to go outside to take a restroom break. I would ease back in the class, and, and I would get me a, open somebody lunch and eat off their sandwich and leave it in there, <laughs> or bite off their apple, whatever it took. I, to I did to it to try to survive. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, let's, so once you start going to Hobo Alley, what you call it? Hobo? Yeah, Hobo Jungle. Hobo Jungle uh, at eight or nine years old. Tell me how you started uh, you up the game a little bit. Yeah, so, you know, because I kind of up my game. I learned that day. I learned how to shoot dice. I learned how to play cards. I really, my father didn't curse, so I learned how to curse. From the hobos. <laughs> From the hobos. I learned all that. I learned how to um, tell jokes. I tell people I'm the best joke teller in America, um, that I could tell jokes. I could remember those things. But when I went to school, I couldn't remember anything. You know, <laughs> it was like they was my friends. They right. could relate to me. I could relate to them. And, uh, but in school, I, I, I was angry. I couldn't, I couldn't get with it because I sit in the back of the class. Being dark, that was my seat in the back. I couldn't get the teacher water, and I saw other girls doing it. I couldn't erase the board. I saw other kids doing that, so I got angry. And uh, I noticed that I was being treated different, you see? So that was a start of me that, that, that in my mind, I started thinking that if I have something, I'll get get a chance to be recognized like everybody else. I, I'll be people will like me, you see, mm -hmm. like they do everybody else, and they would treat me kind. So I, my father had sent for my grandmother, and my grandmother came down with us for a while. It was really a zany, but we called her grandma. And she stayed with us for a while, and she started combing my hair and sending me to school and cleaning me up and talking to me. And she said, you the seventh child. You're born for good luck in this family. You're going to take your sisters and brothers out of poverty. And she said, God got you. He's going to bless you. And I was like, for real, Grandma? And she tell me, don't hate nobody. Love everybody because you don't want to block your blessings. And I would, you know, I would listen at her. And when she passed on a, a couple of years later, then that, that mother figure went out of my life again. How old were you then? So I was angry. I, I must have been about... 11 or 12, somewhere around there. Wow. So that was, she was gone. And there we is again. I'm by, by myself with my father doing the best he could with all 12 of us. But nobody seemed to care about how we really felt, you know. Right. In school, no, no, nobody. I mean, I had one girl in my book, you will see, that I talk about her. 40 some years later, that impact still sets with me that she brought me a bag of clothes wow. to school and eased them to me when I got ready to go home and say, this is for you. You don't have to tell anybody. I gave you this. And those clothes wasn't, they wasn't new clothes. Like I say, they was used clothes, but they was new to me. It was like I had been in the store shopping. So I and remember girl, that your to own this, age? this day. She was in school with me and my, one of my classmates. What real a quiet, sweet thing for a little girl to do. Sitting in class and, she, and nobody never knew. You see, she gave me that, so I can remember that. But um, so after that, after that, I was I, about 13, 14. Here I am. I, I know how to make a way for us now. I'm, I'm gambling. I'm shooting dice. I'm breaking everybody, getting my way with them cars and them dice. And my brothers would take me around with them, and they go scrack up a gambling gang, and they say, "Well, my sister, we're gonna let her shoot the dice." And I'd shoot the dice, and we'd win. So I knew how to shoot the dice. I knew how to curse, so I was, could fit right in. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was 15, 
I got pregnant at the age of 15. At the age of 15, I got pregnant. I really didn't even know I was pregnant. Really, for real, I had a baby nine months, never saw one doctor until it was time to deliver the baby. Never had no, no, no checkup. Never had told my father he gave me money to go to the clinic. I never went. I'd go he knew play. you were pregnant? Yes, he found out I was pregnant. He was upset about it. And my mother came. That's when my mother come on the scene and said, let him marry her. He can't do her no more harm than he already did. If he want to marry her, let him marry her. So here I am at 15 years old marrying a grown man. And you how old was your like, husband? Uh, he was, I think it was 20, 20 or 21 at the time. I married him. And we, uh, I went on and married him. After the baby was a week old, I married him. We got married November the 13th. She was born November the 7th. So I married him and went on to, I lived, moved in with one of my, my oldest sister. She gave us a place to stay. And we moved with my oldest sister until her and her husband decided they would give us, get our own apartment. He gave me one of his apartments, uh, my sister's husband. And I moved in that. And from that, I started bringing my sisters one at a time, out of them woods to my house. What a I beautiful story. It, Hold your thought, it. Marie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Caller, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Talk to us. Yes, it's Miss Martha Marie Preston in. Yeah. yeah, she's here. Talk to us. You're on the you're on TV with us. Talk to us. Oh, okay. Uh, first of all I want to say congratulations, Miss Marie. Thank you. Are you able to watch the show tonight? Are you are are you seeing us? Yes, ma'am. I okay. see you guys live. Okay, All right. good. All right. Good. Do you have any questions or you just want to congratulate Miss Marie? Uh, I just wanted to call in and give her congratulations. This is one of her grandsons, Quincy Dukes. Okay. <laughs> well thank you, Quincy, and it's gonna get good. We're gonna get on with this story. Thanks for calling, okay? <laughs> okay, thank you. We're we'll tuned in. Thank you. Okay, so you got up out those woods, it married, and you started taking your sisters out. Let's yeah. talk about that. I started uh, getting my sisters. I talked to my husband. I said, I, I wasn't happy. You know, I said, uh, I want my sisters with me. So he said, well, okay. He, he had a job. He worked. He worked for White's Cafeteria. He was a cook, a chef cook. So he worked every day. So every day I'd get my sister, and she'd come up, and she moved in with me. Then I'd go back and get another one. We lived in a one-bedroom apartment at that time. So I was bringing them up out of them woods one at a time. And they was all living in the apartment with us. And the lady that ran the apartment, she's my friend to this day, too, named Barbara Henderson, she noticed the traffic going in and out of the apartment. And she said people had started reporting that. It's a lot of young people up in that apartment going in and out every day. And uh, they was wondering what was going on. And so she stopped me and said that, um, who, who was it? And I told it was my sisters. And some of them was my brothers I had started bringing with me. And she said, well, that's a one-bedroom apartment. Y'all can't live in it like that. So you, either you got to get a big apartment or you got to move. So I moved. I uh, found another apartment. They had just built these apartments on something, Murray, brand new, two bedrooms. So I went and moved in a two-bedroom apartment. I mean, I took my family with me, my sisters and brothers. And so after they moved in with me, all of them, they had jobs. They worked, they worked at the cafeteria with my husband. And I kept the kids. I kept the babies. So by me keeping the babies, I could still move around. <laughs> I could get somebody to watch the kids <laughs> while I go shoot dice, and go play cards, and gamble. And gamble. I was gambling. Yeah. I was making that money. You know, I found another way to make a living for my family. I said, I could do this. I was making more money than he was making, and he was a chef cook. So, And I thought that for a minute that we had a happy little marriage, and I had my family. I had about three of my sisters and a couple of my brothers living with me at that time. And uh, my sister had had a kid, and she had a kid with us. And so we was doing OK. We was doing good until uh, he decided that he wanted to make cheat. And I didn't understand that. He wanted and to cheat on you? He wanted to cheat. He wanted to cheat. He wanted to talk to another girl. <coughs> and I got upset. And I decided that this was it for him. And I decided to show him how to cheat. You know, so, you know, back then, you, you do you, you're going to do him. And I know got me right. a little boyfriend, too. 
started <laughs> how old so were you? I decided, I decided that's it for him. About how old were you? Oh, I must have been about 18. I about 18. Now, yeah. so you're going to get you a boyfriend, so too. Boyfriend. He has a boyfriend, girlfriend. girlfriend. You're going to get you a boyfriend. boyfriend. That's mm -hmm. right. So I started dating him. So by the time I was about 20, I guess about 20, 21, we was quit, and we decided to go our separate ways and get our divorce. Well, I decided to get a job. At, um, Hold that thought about your job, and let's mm -hmm. see if we can take this caller. Okay. Oh, no call. Let's try again. Okay. No mm -hmm. caller. Yes. All right. Yeah, so I decided I'd get a job. I got me a job. I used to be a forklift driver uh, for a Continental Box. I worked there for a minute, and a friend of mine took me out to a company, a print company, and we went out there, and I got a job there. And we was working there, and it was a lot of... You know, it was hard work, but I didn't mind doing hard work. I grew up hard, so hard work wasn't going to hurt me now. Right. You see, I was used to that. So working in that, in that job, I got hurt. And when I got hurt on that job, uh, they gave me a cellmate, and I took that cellmate. Hold on, hold that thought. Okay. Caller, you're on. Hi, how you doing? I have a question for Miss Marie. Yes. Uh... I want to know, how would one apply the rules in the book to their life? How would they what? He said, how, the how caller they said, how... The book to, one, to their life. How would they apply the How book? would they apply the rules in the book to one's life? Oh, if you read the book, right. it's going gonna, it's gonna to walk you step by step. In my life, I found out that for me, I couldn't do nothing but I Christ. Everything that I did on my own, I failed. Even though I, I thought I was being successful with it, but, but I Christ in my life, I, I found out that I was guided the wrong way. It was just a setup for me. I had to get spiritually grounded and know not just who I am, but whose I am to uh, deal with society out here as a whole because every day is not going to be what you want it to be. But if you, your faith is what's going to make you whole. My faith kept me going. If you read the book, you'll see that it'll help you a lot in, 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 in things in your, in your path that you travel in the road that you travel. She has a great story, caller. Uh, thanks for calling in, and please uh, tune in next week. Okay. Um, so you were a forklift driver, mm -hmm. got hurt in your job, mm -hmm. and you got a settlement. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. All right. Uh, so I took that money, and having that money, um, I decided that, you know, someone came to me with a deal to take that money and double it. My brother, he said, we could um, double his money, we triple his money, and so we did. In the drug game. And, yeah, we took it and invested in what you call cough syrup at that time. It was Robitussin cough syrup. So we we took that money and invested in the, in the Robitussin cough syrup gang, and the money came back like uh, uh, so quick till. I was like, okay, let's do this again. <laughs> and we started just flipping that money. And we flipped that money enough to where I ended up um, getting me a nightclub. First I had a record shop. Then I opened up me a nightclub. And I opened up the uh, Myosha Club. It was on um, Jensen Drive first. That was my first mm -hmm. club. And I made a lot of money in that club, legitimate money. That money was legit. I made, I made, um, I made a lot of money there. And um, having that club, I, I met um, the, what I thought the man of my life, my dreams. I met a rich man. His name was Billy McGee, and I married him. All right. He was 30 years my senior. And, uh, he was an old man. <laughs> oh, yes, I did. Some people call him old. I said he was an old young man to me. Mm -hmm. And I married him. And, How old were you and then? I was um, 28 when I married him. Wow. Okay. And um, I married Billy, and from there... My life took another turn. I got a chance to go places that I'd never been in my life. I ended up with, with um, friends that I never thought I would have, and people started respecting me. And, you know, I started to, <laughs> the co community people, I, I started giving to the community, helping people. And I had more than enough. I felt like I had enough to last a lifetime. For my first year. Hold that thought. Let's see if we have another caller. Caller, mm -hmm. you're on. Yes. Hello. Yes, yes. we're here. We're talk waiting for you. How are you tonight? I'm I'm great. I'm great. How are you this evening? Good, thank you. <laughs> are you enjoying our guest tonight? Uh yes, I'm is she talking to me or somebody else? 
I'm talking to you. Turn your TV down so we can hear you getting an echo. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, we can hear you absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay, we got it down. I just want to know, is that the queen you got there? <laughs> yes, ma'am, it's the queen. That's the queen. That's Martha Marie Preston. We are so proud of her. We are proud of her. All righty. Madam <laughs> President, the queen, Martha Marie Preston. She's the queen. We're going to be... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for calling and tune in next week when we'll tell another great story. But let's let let's let Martha keep uh, telling her story. It's a great one. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> All right, that's a great story. So you married Billy McGee, the love of your life, okay. and uh, he's got you the respect you needed in the community. What was his profession? Right. Uh -huh. He had uh, been in a night. He was in nightclub business, mm -hmm. had liquor stores and property, and he was. In, he liked to invest in turning his money. He would invest people that couldn't get loans from the bank. He would loan them the money. All right. He was and a loan shark. He was a loan shark. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was a great thing. That first year I married him, I, he bought me a Rolls Royce for my first anniversary. What? And I was like, wow, I didn't even know how to spell it. What it was. <laughs> but I was driving a brand new Rolls Royce all over this city. You know, wow. I was like, wow. You know, he said, whatever, whatever I wanted, I could get. He bought me everything I wanted. I mean, I had Porsches, limousine, Mercedes, you know, just whatever I wanted. Um, wow. And then um, things went bad. You know, I used to say, well, this is the end of this chapter. <laughs> it's going to be a closed chapter here. I really don't need that. I'm still looking for something else. It was still something missing. Um, and um, we, we decided that we would get our divorce and go our separate ways. And you know how the public is. They go to saying that she done broke him, but I could have never broke him. He, he had his money. And really, I had mine. And as his wife, I deserved whatever I got. I mean, 30 years, of course, you know. I had to put some things on hold for a minute. <laughs> and so um, I went on and... He went on about his business, but by that How time, long you I, had, um, I was married to him from 78 to, I think, 84, 85, something like that. And uh, so we went, we went our separate ways, and we ended up, uh, it was just a sky limit. I had everything I thought I needed at the time. I had money, I had respect, you see, that I, th I thought people would come to me, I could help them, uh, wasn't no problem. I had, had started hiring people. I had a construction company, wow. so I was hiring employees. I had probably about 30, 40 employees there. Had the nightclub, my OSHA uh, on Titwell End, so I could um, hire people. People, a lot of people that worked in my club sent their kids to school or to college from working at my OSHA. Then I had the convenience stores, two of them, and, I bought a shopping center, so I was doing quite well. I just had what I needed, you know. How did you get it caught? How, let's talk about, let's get to the, uh, the drug conviction. How did you get to a point with your businesses in the community, having the Myosha Club that's doing really right, well, right. having the, the construction company when the yeah. construction was booming in mm -hmm. the 80s, Yes. Uh, and then having, because real estate was booming then, mm -hmm. and having two convenience stores, what went wrong? How did yeah. you end up in, 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 federal, uh, in a federal drug conspiracy case? What, what I did is I, I'm going to tell you, Vivian, and it was, and I'm not proud of that, but someone came to me and uh, asked me to invest a big piece of money uh, for me, and they said that, listen, your return on this is going to be more than you could probably make in uh, almost a lifetime. And I, I kind of, <laughs> I got greedy, greed, greed. And, 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 and poverty driven, was scared not to be broke again. You know, being a single woman, I said, I'm going to do this thing my way. And I didn't want to go back to poverty. So I said, listen, uh, I'm going to do it. I, I invested and it worked for me and I kept investing my money. I didn't really sell drugs myself. I didn't touch drugs. I invest my money mm -hmm. in the business, you see? And um, investing that money, kept making money. You know how you get in and you decide that, hey, this is fast, quick, you know, her money, and it's getting you everything you think you want. You think you got it made, and you think uh, that this is it. But, but let me say this. Be, before the feds come up on me, I really had quit. I had really gotten out the business. I got out the business, and one day, the feds come, 
and come to my club and brought a sealed indictment with 28 other people on the indictment. Some of these people I didn't even know. I had never heard of them before. And they indicted me with uh, Johnny Binder, his girlfriend, and uh, 26 more other people. Now, being indicted there, I'm like, okay, uh, Ger Johnny Binder was not my partner mm -hmm. in the drug business. He leased my shopping center from me. He leased a part of it. And what he kind of also, business did he lease from you? He leased the uh, convenience store on the end, mm -hmm. and he, he leased the last part of it for a music. It was a music company that he had put in, and then he opened up an after-hour club in there himself, okay? Um, and, that, and he ended up with that, that part of my business. Uh, so I still had a beauty script. shop you I own the whole, whole script. script. That's right. So he leased part of that from me. And then his singer, which was Cynthia Roberts at the time, she sung in my nightclub in Myosha. But she was under contract. She was getting paid to sing. He was recording her, you know, to take her big time. So she sung in my club, gave me a pretty good deal, and was filling the club up every night. So she sung in my club. Hold that thought, and let's see if we have a caller on the line. Caller, call you're on. Please please turn your music down. I mean, turn the TV down a little bit so we can hear you. Okay, how are you? How are you? Fine. I have a few questions for Ms. Preston. Yes, ma'am. I want to know, I hear, I heard someone calling her grandson. Yes. What is she doing now to prevent what she's done? I hear she's talking about drugs and all that. But what is she doing to prevent that her children and her generation does not repeat the same cycle? That's a good question. Good I'll question. let her answer that. Yes, good question. I have a group of women now since I've been home called Elite Ladies of Expression, and we deal with uh, the criminal justice system, homelessness, unemployment. Can you hear us? Can we, hear, we can hear some kids crying in the background, so can you hear her? I'm sorry about okay. That. Okay. So uh, she has this group called Elite Ladies of, Dis uh, of, of Distinction. Expression. Of expression. expression. Okay. Explain that. Yes. And what we do is we 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 kind of take for me. I took my own grandkids in, and my daughter, and set them down when I come home, and and talk with them about the system, and let them know that they don't want to get caught up in this system like this. My grandsons work on the waterfront, both of them, but my daughter is in. The business, I have a health and wellness business. I sell nutritional products and stuff. I work for a company that's really, we are, I tell people we have the best products in the world. And um, what we do is um, I have my daughter in that business so they can have their own, be their own CEO or their own company. They can make as much money as they want to make. This company doesn't care whether you come from Yale or jail. It's a company of integrity. Honestly, as long as you do that, you can do the right thing. I pray for them, I pray over them, and I keep them in church. I, I tell them, this is what you need to do. Uh, a lot of times I get them and take them to church with me to make sure that they're there because I know without Christ in their life, they're not going to make it. I don't care how much they get. Okay, that's your question that I really want to know. What would you give back to the community, not just to the community, but also to her children and maybe grandchildren or great grand. Mm -hmm. Is she doing something that way? Mm -hmm. It's very possible. I'm keeping them out of trouble for one thing, and I'm I'm setting up uh, a fund. Whatever I have, if it's only I only have that uh, one daughter. So having that one daughter and and uh, two grandsons and a granddaughter and three great grandkids, everything I have is set for my daughter, for my family to we, take over. And we also have Dee in the in the uh, studio. Let me let, Dee hadn't said anything. Dee, uh, and Dee is a very good friend of Marie, and she she's a self-employed person also, and, uh, and, and, and is always with Miss, Miss Marie. What do you think, uh, Dee, we can do to try to encourage our kids and the kids in your, in your two households to uh, stay out of crime? What we do is our organization, Elite Ladies of Expression, which she was trying to explain. In the Elite Ladies of Expression, we have that module of criminal, okay? And everyone that comes or call us, including her kids, she's trying to keep them out the life of crime. 
because she's been there. And she don't want them to make the same mistakes that she made. Well, now, the uh, elite ladies of expression are a lot of the women, uh, have they been to prison or been touched no. by the criminal justice system? No. But women who have been are not excluded from that group. No, no. Because some groups are so exclusive that they exclude people no. they don't have the right no. pedigree. No. Because even though you might not have been there. I just want to know what was she doing. I heard a grandson of someone called in mm -hmm. and mentioned that he was a grandson. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people forget to say, you know, about their children, and I would like to know what they're doing for them. Yes. You know how the most of the celebrities are. Yes, ma'am, I understand, and she's working real hard to make sure that her grandson does not, uh, does not uh, get in, in the criminal justice system by telling her story. Uh, we're t going through it slowly, but we're telling the story, and the end of the story is not to get involved in the criminal justice Amen. system. Amen. That's right. Amen. Thank you for calling. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so let's talk about... Uh, uh, let's talk about the uh, the case. Okay, so you, we're talking about being indicted with people that you didn't know right. that you had gotten out of the game with. So what was the evidence that they they had against you? Well, what they done is they came with a 28 count indictment uh, with a CCE. That's continually criminal enterprise. That's a that one count could have landed me a uh, life with no possibility of parole in prison. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm a first time nonviolent offender. You mean tell me I'm facing life with no possibility of parole on just this one count? And here I, I'm sitting here with 20, 26, other, 26 other people with a 28 count indictment. So I had no choice but to go to trial to try to prove my innocence because a lot of the things that they said I had done, I was not guilty of it. I mean, and I could not uh, in good conscience say to lie to save myself to say something against uh, Johnny Binder that was not true. So one of the and, uh, deals that the feds wanted to make you was to, because this was a federal case, was that you, if you testify against Johnny Binder, then we'll go light on you. No, no they, they tried to make that deal with him. Mm -hmm. they, what they asked is, do you want to talk, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you want to do you want to cut a deal? They'll ask you that every time they pick you up. They're gonna ask you that. Uh, and if you if you uh, they have a, a case uh, where it's a five K one they call that snitch jacket that if you want to roll over on somebody you can. But I I had nothing to tell them because what had happened with me I was guilty of some of it. Okay, so my guilt I was willing to take my licking and keep on kicking. I th in my mind that it wouldn't have been as, as harsh as it was, no way, and that I could run down there and do that little time and get on back here. But being in trial for 12 and a half weeks and hearing all that evidence, I, um, I ended up with a 40-year sentence. Wow. And hold that, hold, hold that thought. Years. We have somebody on the line. Uh, caller, you're on. You're on. Uh, what's your question, sir? Yes, uh, I just want to tell um, Ms. Uh, Preston that we really appreciate her not using. Excuse me? Not using what? Uh, for, for not using the revolving door, going back into the prison okay. and out here trying to make a difference in the community. Uh, she's a very loving person, and we really appreciate her in the community. And we just want to tell her to continue doing the work that she's doing, uh, that more people would be able to see her. And my question to her would be, ma'am, how do you keep yourself so beautiful? And doing such a wonderful job. All right, sounds like you're trying to rap tonight. You're supposed to be asking a question about the criminal justice system. Uh, but thank you. That's a that's a good question. I and tell people it ain't me; it's the God in me. Thank you for that. Thank you for but calling. Thank you. Call, watch us next week. Um, okay, so keep keep going. So you had a 12 and a half week trial. Yes. You were guilty of some of it, yes. but not all of it. And unfortunately, with the feds, a lot of times is that they have a large indictment, yes. a bunch mm -hmm. of counts. They don't let you say, well, I'm guilty of this. Right. Let me plead guilty to what I am right. guilty of right. and punish. It's all or nothing for the All feds. or nothing. That's and right. The, and the thing that's uh, sometimes unfair is that people that are snitching on the street will sometimes say what they think you're doing, and they don't right. know. And don't know. And so a lot of times people on the street get in trouble, 
uh, drug addicts. They see that Marie owns a strip center. They mm -hmm. see that Johnny Binder, who is flashy and seen by people, he's renting from them. So they must be in cahoots together. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, That's and don't right. realize that that doesn't mean that they're in cahoots together. That's right. And so once the feds get something in their mind, the story sounds good. Good. Mm -hmm. And they want to make it stick. Right. Because uh, most people, uh, in my experience, being a criminal lawyer, is that people, once they're tired, and they usually, once they get caught, they're ready to plead guilty to what they did, mm -hmm. but they're not ready to plead guilty to what they didn't do. That's right. So, you know, it, it, when you're out here and you're a juror, uh, listen to what people are talking about, because uh, people are not really trying to waste your time and trick you. So right. talk to me about that, Yeah, Marie. you know, and, and when people, when you, in, when you get caught up in this system, a lot of times that uh, people get cases that's unrelated. They have anything to do with you, mm -hmm. but the, the, the feds want you. They want and to. they feel like, well, hey, we need your cooperation. Mm -hmm. These people might not even know you, right. but they are willing to take the stand against you. Right. But the feds say, yeah, I know her. Uh, yeah, she sells drugs. Oh, you know that? Yeah, I, I know her. She sells drugs. She's a big drug dealer. They'll do all kind of stuff, and it doesn't matter with them. They just want a conviction. Right, and, and a lot of the people that were charged with you and went to trial did not get convicted. They was found right. not guilty. That's Everybody that went to so. trial with me was found not guilty. All those who decided to cop a plea, some of them got three-year probation, some of them got a three-year sentence, but the ones that sat around the table and went to trial with me, all of those people was found not guilty except for Johnny Binder, who they gave him 40 years, the same 40 years they gave me, and his girlfriend, Cynthia Roberts. They gave her, I think, about a three or four year sentence. Um, but everybody else was found not guilty. So the but, singer in the club went to jail? Yeah, she went yeah, to she jail. Did. She was his girlfriend, so that they felt like that was his money because he was getting ready to produce her and cut an album on her. And uh, they knocked her off, too, and sent her right on to prison with him. Well, talk about your experience in prison. We have 15 minutes left, and I okay. want to kind of fast forward. This, t this yeah. hour goes by fast. Right. So t All let's right. talk about your experience in prison. You got a 40-year sentence. How much time did you actually do? I did 10 years on that 40 years. And while I was in prison, this is, this is something that, to me, everybody need to do. See, I said that Hitner gave me that 40-year sentence. I took that lemon, that was a lemon for me, and made lemonade out of it. I said, God did it. Because every, every dime that I spent trying to get out, I couldn't. It didn't work. It failed. It failed. I failed miserably with that. And uh, I can remember um, my father leading me to the word, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, the 23rd numbers of song, to, uh, to help me because at that time I was about ready to give up. You know, I was ready to take my life and get on about here. I wasn't finna do no 40 years. I couldn't see doing 40 years. But, uh, and, the, and the Holy Spirit hit me in the pit of my stomach and came to me. And uh, at that time, I, I, I decided, I made that decision myself, that choice. That's what I tell people. We have a choice. You can make, we make good choices, bad choices. I had made some bad choices. And um, I decided to ask Christ to come in my life. And, and when I did, looked like he was right there waiting. And he came in to my life, and that never occurred to me anymore. So I said, what I'm going to do is do my time. And the way I'm going to do it is one day at a time. And I started doing my time. And in doing my time and, and praying and reading the Word and really understanding the Scripture and the Word, and um, then it came to me. God just spoke to me, and I went to law school, got my paralegal license while I was in there. I got my cosmetology license. I just programmed. I took every program I can, JC's, Toastmasters, everything I could take. Now, I'm not knowing that I'm going to ever get out. So I didn't have to go in doing the right thing. Right. When I got in, I could have been the worst person on the inside that could be. I had nothing to lose. I already had 40 years. But it was that, that, that change that happened in my life that caused me to want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So I did the right thing on the inside. That whole 10 years of my life, I was inside helping others helping them research their cases. I had uh, fought the Justice Department. They had, uh, had, we made them put a dual system in. We won a class action suit, the women's on the inside. I'm part of that class action suit. But we fought them to put a dual system in so people could call home the mothers and have a relationship with their kids and their grandkids. So we won that case. Mm -hmm. And as I was working on the inside, looking for a case for somebody else, looked like it just raised off the paper one day. My freedom 
You see, I looked and saw this case, filed it back to the court, hidden and granted it in part, changed it, and he denied it in part. But it was enough for me to take it and send it to the parole commissioner. And they looked at it, and they looked at the case, and they decided to, to bring me to the board, put me in front of the board, and they gave me my freedom wow. after 10 years. Mm -hmm. And 10 years after, after doing 10 years in prison, I come home, it was like everybody had saw a ghost. I came out and they said, well, she out. I don't know how she got out. Did she snitch? No, I didn't have to snitch. I didn't do that. God did it. I tell them, it's all God. It's all good. Because man couldn't do it. They couldn't get me out. But the parole board, it, it was enough for them to look. And so you know God had to place it on their heart to even look at me. Right. After 10 years, and they let me go. Well, but if anybody is watching here, this, because, uh, you know, we know that the federal system doesn't have a parole. So right. you're talking about parole and federal. Explain that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, well, it, we, we was caught between that 19... 86, 87 Act. Mm -hmm. He could have, the law had changed. He could have sentenced me under the new law, but sentencing me under the new law would have gotten me anywhere with the amount of drugs they say was in my case was 204 grams of powder cocaine, not even crack cocaine, could have landed me anywhere from probation to five years. Well, uh -huh. so he decided to take me back to the old law and sentence me old and new law. Mix and it got to mix them up, run them consecutive, and it got me the 40-year sentence. So with that, then I was able to get out, you see? So when I got out, I was working at a boy's home, working with guys, kids that was on drugs, and kids that had all kind of mental challenges and problems. I kept doing the right thing, kept praying, kept going to church, kept doing what I know how to do, helping people. And... Um, the parole, uh, the uh, probation, my parole officer called me and told me to sit down and said they had terminated my sentence. I got the case where they terminated my sentence by. I had filed a paper, filed it back, you see, the, the paper, and it came back, you see. It came back, the letter even unopened. So I know it was a God thing because they, they uh, called me on the phone and told me to sit down, that wow. you, you, we terminated your other 30 years. They terminated that sin of somebody. Wow, that, what a and, blessing you know, that is. And that mm -hmm. ain't nothing but God. And this God is all good. I know when he show up, he shows out. So he worked a miracle in my life. So I tell people all the time, you get by, but you don't get away. Mm -hmm. In this system right here, this, we have a terrible criminal justice system for our people. More our people was locked up with longer sentences that had, did less, had less in their cases. I saw uh, Caucasians, I saw Spanish people, and our people, first-time offenders, a lot of them had life sentences. Wow. Some of them had 30 and 40 years. Well, some of those people had, them Caucasians had been in trouble since they was young, all their life, and they was walking away with eight years, five years, 10 years, I'm looking at their papers, reading them, and I'm like, how can this be fair? That is not fair at all. So I tell our people all the time, don't get caught up in the mm -hmm. system. Anybody that's doing wrong, you're going to get by, but you're gonna, you won't get away. You're going to pay as you enter, you're going to pay as you go, or you're going to charge now and pay later. This is unjust. It's unjust when it comes to sentencing us. We have an unjust system for our people. Hold so, that thought, Marie. Let's take this caller. Caller, you're on. Yes, I'd like to know how many brothers and sisters did you have? Now, it's, it's seven girls and five boys. Oh, okay. And you were the which child? I'm the seventh child. You say the one boy for good luck, the seventh. Oh, yes, ma'am. I was reading your book. What was it like growing up with um, your, your father? I, I loved, I, I, you know what, my father is 88 years old to this day. I love my father. He was a good man. I tell people all the time he was a kind man. I guess that's one of the reasons that we, I ended up out of this system today because he was a good man and he took us to church and he prayed over us. And they say the prayers of the righteous avail it much. So I think it was my father's prayers that pleading to the, to the high God to uh, take care of me and to let me go because he is still to this day, he's blind, but he's a kind man. He's a good man. I take him to dialysis. 
every morning, three times a week at least right now. He's a good man. He's still with us. I thank God for him, and I thank God for my 86-year-old mother while I was in the system who came there everywhere I went all over this country. He couldn't stand to see me inside locked up, but she came to see about me every step of the way. So and I by thank the grace God for God, back she, in. she told me that they, she, she was able to patch up her relationship yep. with her mother because That's she right. was, even though she abandoned her at eight, she came back in her life when she uh, oh, yes. was a, uh, got married and went, went to prison. She, yes, she, she was. She'd yes. never gotten on a plane before telling what you she told She never me. gotten on a plane her life. But when I got locked up and they shipped me to Lexington, Kentucky, away from my family, my mother got on that plane, her and my sister, and came to see oh. about me. So it sounds like y'all are a close network family. Yeah. Yes, we are. I love my family. Oh. I mean, I always have. And I, I guess that's one of the things that I've always done is everything that I ever done, hustle, I did it for my family. Thank you, you know. so much, caller. And please listen to the end. We're going to wrap this up and uh, listen to us next Wednesday at 630. Thanks for, for, thank you for your call. Um, so, um, yeah, the uh, disparity in the sentencing is always a problem uh, when you see people with short sentences and life sentences. Um, you said you were even in there with a person named Leona Hensley. Hensley, Hensley right? Hensley, yes. Right. They called her Hotel Queen. She had a tax evasion case, but she, um, she wasn't there that long. She didn't have that much, much time. You, you could see she got out. She had it, you know, it was easy for her. And um, um, uh, they showed favoritism. You know, she had it easier. And so the Leona Hemsley is like the Martha Stewart of today. Oh, yes, for, she for was. For kids that don't know yes, who uh, Leona Hemsley was. Yeah, she was the hotel queen. She had the Hensley Hotels. Right. Yes. Okay, well, we're going to be uh, wrapping it up, and we haven't spoken much to Dee. So, Dee, what do you want to tell uh, young oh, people no. about uh, staying out of the criminal justice system? Uh, because that's really the, the method to the madness. We want to educate people through story. Um, and so what, what, what has been your experience, and what can you say to young people? Um, or I'm, mothers of, of, of kids in trouble. Yes, because I did have a son in trouble. And they tried to give him 25 years for his first time. But we fought the system, and that was in Louisiana. And he got seven years. And those years, he's out, he's fine, he's off of parole. He's a great model for young people at the age of 39. Is he working now? Is he gangbanging? Oh my God! Work? Yes, he is. He um, he worked in the system in Louisiana as a welder. That same company kept him, and when he came out, he had a month to get everything together. And then after he got that month, he went back to work because they kept him on, and he's been with that company going on five years since he's been out. So we're happy. That's We're a, that's happy because he story. is a role model. He's a role model for, for me to know that, you know, I know you can turn your life around. And I appreciate that. Yes. And that's my baby boy. Yes. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we have about five minutes, so let's start wrapping it up, Marie. Yeah. What, what I, what I, what I want to say is to ex-offenders. I know that uh, here... They can't get a job. A lot of times, they cannot get a job. And it's, it's, it, it get, put them in a position where they have to do something wrong or either go back in the system right. or whatever. But I tell people that uh, when I came home, I got, it, I got busy. I had a job at first, but I got hurt on my job, so I couldn't work anymore. I hurt my back. And I started, uh, I went and got in this network marketing company, the health and wellness company, Artists International. Mm -hmm. They don't care if you come from Yale or jail. If you work this business with integrity and honesty, you can save people's lives by uh, giving them healthy nutrition, and you can get wealth okay, while you're stop. doing let's, it. Let's not say the name okay. of the company. All right. So I, done, I, done, I do real well in this company. It, it has afforded me to have my own office and own my own business. What do you think about men? Uh, you know, men are not always into selling health and wellness. So what do you think about what can men do when they get out of jail? Well, what, what's it's, good business? It's, it's for anybody. It's, I mean, we have a lot of men in this company. That now, I have a good friend that's a, a man that's uh, okay. been, in the, been in the system, and he likes uh, working out. You know, some men right. like to work out. They find a passion in that when they're in jail. And he learned to, uh, now he's a personal trainer. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the person that's, that's doing good. their own business. Uh, t shirts. Uh, sell t shirts. That's uh, it. New lands, uh, uh, lawn care. I, lawn care. I represented a guy once that had a federal case. We beat the federal case, but he got convicted in state court. And mm -hmm. when he came out, 
uh, he, he started a landscaping mm -hmm. business. Right. And right. he's doing real well with right. that. I mean, you start little right. in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you build up to the businesses in the neighborhood, right. Right. and before you know it, if you're good at it, you, get you have a skill. Right. Mm -hmm. I tell him that only, but all that, in, in doing all that, if you don't get Christ in your life and get solid, get you a foundation, get Christ in your life, all that is not going to mean a thing because when the ways of the world come at you, you won't be able to sustain. You, right. will, you will fall weak and you'll, you, you, you'll be the system. You'll be right back in it. So we have to have that in our life to know just not just who we are but who we are because people are going to always bring your past, your, your past to you. But I tell them that when God changes you, old things are passed away. All things become brand new. So I'm a new creature in Christ. You can't hold me in bondage with my past. You can't hold me hostage with that. It's just what it is. It's my past. It's a stepping stone to help me get to where I'm on my way to now and helping other people. What do you tell young girls that are like, uh, one of the things I find difficult in ministering to young girls is that they get caught up with men. You know, you can get them straight when we have those heart-to-heart, -heart, mm -hmm. tough love talk to mm -hmm. girls because, you know, we're all from the street. Right. We've had tough lives. I didn't yeah. have a mother either. So, uh, and that makes us harder than mm -hmm. the average woman with a mother. Mm -hmm. We talked about that. That's right. But when you try to talk to these young girls, you can have their minds right. Mm -hmm. and, but when they're 20, 21, 22, and they still hot to trot, they get, a, get with a, a guy that turns their mind around, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they control them. So it's difficult. What do you tell girls who are uh, in this system that need to try to change their lives. Yeah, well, what they have to do is they still, the basis is, see, we can't really change nobody. Only God can. If you, if you, you have to show them the way. And they if have you to surrender. show them the way, I think and they got surrender. to surrender all. You they got to surrender. to surrender all. They can't do half 99 and half angle. Do You can't fake that. It ain't no fake thing. It's got to be for real. It's got to be rooted and grinded in it. And that's what's going to keep them. When a man tell them that, they'll be able to say, no, you say I'm nobody, but I'm a child of the king. Uh -huh. nine, nine, and and, I, and he, do. yeah, and, and, and you know I, he got true? all the yes. money, all the power, and all the glory. Yeah. So I got what I need. Because when I couldn't lean on my own stand, I lean on the Lord. I tell people all the time, I do all that I can do. Mm -hmm. And then God do what I cannot do. Well, we're mm -hmm. going to wrap it up for tonight. Uh, thank you, listeners, for watching our show. We've had a great guest, uh, Marie Preston, here tonight. She has this, gr this great book. She's written about her story. She came to share her story so that people will understand a little bit more about the tough road in the criminal justice system. Not to get in the system, yes. but if you are in the system, you can still have faith and you can still have a second chance. Yes. Thank you, Dee, for also coming in and talking tonight and sharing the experience of your son mm -hmm. and uh, what happened to him and that there can be another road. And uh, we want to just ask people and encourage people to be a part of the criminal justice system, whether it's coming to jury duty, because you can be fair and impartial just like the yes. next person. Mm -hmm. Keeping our kids out of the wrong way, yes. teaching them the right way. Stop jacking people and, and, and putting guns in people's faces. Yes. We will help you before you get in trouble. Yes. You don't have to get in trouble to ask for help later. But even mm -hmm. if you get in trouble, we still are here to give you a second chance. So thank you for watching, and please stay tuned and come back next week at 630. Truth and Justice with Vivian King. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all so much.